the committee hearing will come to order. Uh, and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I want to welcome all of you to this first hearing of the Investigations and Oversight Subcommittee uh, of the Committee of Science and Technology. For purposes of this hearing on the growing role of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OARA, uh, Mr. Costello, who is not here, uh, will serve as the Vice Chairman. Uh, there has not been an Investigations and Oversight uh, Subcommittee of the Committee on Science and Technology for a dozen years, and I look forward to working with all of you, the members who are not here, uh, plus anyone out there as well, uh, working with all of you on a very active, very engaged subcommittee. Uh, we will work to expose abuse of power, corruption, and waste. Uh, a great American political scientist, Woodrow Wilson, called that the informing power of Congress and said that it was probably more important important than Congress's legislative powers. Uh, the light we shine uh, will often be unwelcome uh, by those whose conduct we eliminate, uh, but unflattering scrutiny from Congress uh, should be a healthy deterrent to the abuse of power. Today's hearing is part of our oversight duties to consider broader public policy questions that need the attention of Congress. Uh, I've heard the phrase, it takes an act of Congress uh, my entire life, but it has taken on new meaning for me in these last four years that I have served in Congress. Uh, when Congress enacts legislation to protect public health, the environment, safety, civil rights, privacy, uh, and on and on, Congress cannot possibly anticipate every circumstance that will arise, and Congress cannot possibly address every new circumstance by new legislation. So Congress has long delegated to federal agencies the power to enforce the laws that Congress passes and to adopt regulations that address circumstances with, within the intended uh, protection of the legislation, but not specifically addressed. Federal agencies frequently rely on scientific research, whether applied or basic, uh, to inform their decisions. Scientific research within the jurisdiction of the Committee on Science and Technology, a research by NOAA, EPA, NIH, the Departments of Labor and Agriculture, is all properly part of rulemaking decisions, as are the standards and guidelines work at NIST in the Department of Transportation. We spend billions on that research. We should certainly examine how it's used in rulemaking. Uh, rulemaking decisions should properly be based on expertise, but that does not mean that they are beyond challenge. The authority of federal agencies should not amount to government by platonic guardians, experts better informed uh, and wiser than we are and untroubled, and untroubled by tawdry concerns of politics. Uh, Congress and the President should pay close attention when agencies act. Uh, and should pay close attention when agencies fail to act. Uh, and we should pay close attention to the reasons for agency action or inaction. Uh, to what extent uh, is agency action or inaction based on considerations of scientific expertise, such as environmental or public health consequences? And to what extent is agency action or inaction based on economic or political considerations? Uh, when agencies act, they must explain their decisions and allow public participation in that decision. Uh, but are decisions not to act uh, being made in back rooms based upon considerations that never would withstand public scrutiny? Does Executive Order 13422 create an almost insufferable bias uh, in favor of agency inaction, even in the face of clear need for action and a clear statutory directive to act? Uh, does the order shield decisions at agencies from the scrutiny that they should receive? Uh, does the order shift to the present powers that the framers of our Constitution uh, intended the exercise by Congress? I welcome the, te the testimony of our distinguished panelists on those issues. Uh, I also look forward to working uh, with our distinguished ranking member, James Sensenbrenner. Mr. Sensenbrenner is by far my senior in Congress. Uh, he served for four years as chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, excuse me, as, as of this committee, the Committee on Science, six years as chairman of the, of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, and I hope he does not feel that uh, after having been a star player in the big leagues, he has now been uh, sent back to the minors. Um, uh, I thank the gentleman from North Carolina for his comments. Uh, I'm not in the minor leagues. Uh, I have a little bit different role. And not only is this role to keep the agencies on their toes, but also to keep the chairman and the majority on their toes as well. So I'd like to welcome him to the chair of the <laughs> subcommittee and say that I'm looking forward to working with him and working forward to making him a better chair during the next two years. Uh, something for me to look forward to. Um, and I also want to announce uh, the one baseball analogy 
uh, is out of deference and respect to our immediate past chairman, Mr. Uh, Sherry Bullard. Uh, but it will be the policy of this committee going forward uh, that preferred, the preferred sports analogy or analogies to college basketball. Elections, that's, elections have consequences. So that's fine because Wisconsin is ranked third in the country, sir. Uh, may I have an opening statement now? Um, actually, that's um, in my remarks. Uh, and I now um, recognize Mr. Simpson for his opening remarks. Eh. Although this is the first investigations oversight subcommittee hearing since 1995, the record of oversight under my chairmanship speaks for itself. From monitoring the status of the spallation neutron source at the Department of Energy to evaluating the proposal to bring Russia into the International Space Station program, the Science and Technology Committee's vigilant oversight produced better programs and policies and I look forward to returning to this committee and continuing the same rigorous oversight. Having been the chair of two committees, I'm uniquely aware of the topic before us, and I'm glad to see that my colleagues on the Judiciary Committee have taken an interest as well, and their expertise is appreciated. As for the executive order in the OMB bulletin, I'm inclined to think that the issues that will be brought up today have less to do with their policy implications and more to do with who issued them. While I do get concerned when any administration, be it Republican or Democratic, asserts too much control over the regulatory process, it is important to note that organizing that process is not and should not be a partisan endeavor, and it certainly didn't start with the current president. President Clinton, just like several presidents before him, used the regulatory process to advance his own agenda in the waning years of his presidency. Ultimately, these policies last only as long as the current administration allows them to. And the best way to ensure that longevity is to include the legislative branch. To quote a recent article on the topic in CQ Weekly, quote, while executive power is mighty, it is also ephemeral, unquote. Most of the issues that the executive order and the OMB bulletin address are simple clarifications and organizational changes to President Clinton's Executive Order 12866 and will ultimately help OMB better coordinate the regulatory process. None of the amendments call for additional hurdles to be overcome. They simply require the reporting of work that has already been done. Additionally, none of the issues uh, or changes are anything new. All of them have either been released for public comment like the OMB Bulletin on Guidance Documents or our clarifications to President Clinton's original executive order. For example, the OMB bulletin was issued in draft form over a year ago. While 31 comments were received, only three or four were negative. It's also interesting to note that none of our witnesses here today chose to issue comments in that bulletin, save Mr. Kovacs. But OMB will have an opportunity to defend their document at the next hearing before the Judiciary Committee and I am told we'll be inviting them back before us at a later time as well. Right now, I'm more concerned with the impact that these guidance documents and regulations have on the American economy, particularly small businesses that can't afford high-priced counsels and lobbyists to monitor the thousands of guidance documents and rules agencies issue each year. The increased use of guidance documents by agencies to circumvent the <coughs> regulatory process has been diligently documented. They often conflict with each other and are not subject to public notice and comment and rarely receive agency approval, not to mention OMB review. While I am concerned about the impact that presidential appointees may have on the regulatory process, just as in the issue of market failure, these issues have all been addressed previously by other administrations as well. In reality, the EO and the OMB bulletin simply formalized many of the principles derived under the previous administrations. That being said, as a part of this committee's day-to-day -day oversight, I will certainly follow how these changes are implemented to ensure that public health and safety is preserved and that there is transparency and accountability in our regulatory process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sissenbrenner. Uh, and I would now like to welcome our witnesses. Today we are honored to have a very uh, distinguished and knowledgeable panel of witnesses, uh, Ms. Sally Capson the former head of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, again, OIRA, in the Clinton administration, and currently a professor at the University of Michigan Law School. Uh, she is a recognized expert in federal regulatory matters, uh, and we are very pleased to have her here today. Uh, Mr. David Vladek, 
is the director of the Institute for Public Representation and a professor at Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, he is also an expert in administrative and regulatory law, uh, topics on which he writes and testifies frequently before Congress. Uh, Dr. Rick uh, Melberth uh, is the director of uh, federal regulatory policy for OMB Watch, which works to protect and improve the government's ability to develop and enforce safeguards for public health, safety, environment, and civil rights. Uh, and finally, Mr. Bill Kovacs is the Vice President for Environment, Technology, and Regulatory Affairs, uh, the Regulatory Affairs Division for the United States Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the, that division is responsible for such significant issues, uh, including the systematic uh, application of sound science to the federal regulatory process. Uh, now it is the custom of the Investigations and Oversight Subcommittee, uh, well, going back a dozen years when we last had one, it is a custom of the Investigations and Oversight Subcommittee, and it will be our custom going forward, we're establishing it now, uh, to swear in our witnesses. Uh, do any of you have any objection to being sworn in? Okay, if, that, if not, then you, uh, if you would please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay. I think the record can reflect they all said I do. Uh, we will now hear the statements of the entire panel, beginning with Ms. Katzen. Um, to the panel, please uh, limit your remarks to five minutes. Uh, we do have written testimony from all of you. Uh, after all the statements have been received, uh, the uh, oral statements, all members will have five minutes to ask questions. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Cassidy, I think we'll be going with you. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to testify today. During the last six years, there has been a slow but steady change in the process by which federal regulatory agencies develop and issue regulations, specifically in the balance of authority between those agencies and the Office of Management and Budget. With its most recent actions, the Bush administration has taken yet another step restricting agency discretion and making it more difficult for the agencies to do the job that Congress has delegated to them. As you mentioned in your introduction, I served as the administrator of OIRA for over five years during the Clinton administration and was involved in the drafting and implementation of Executive Order 12866. I am a strong proponent of centralized review of agency rulemaking and have often spoken and written in support or defense of OIRA. I'm also a strong proponent of regulations, believing that if carefully crafted, they can improve the quality of our lives, the performance of our economy, and our nation's well-being. Why then am I so critical of the new executive order? I've prepared written testimony that provides extensive background and explanatory information. I would like to use my five minutes to emphasize several important points. First, the Bush administration has, many, has taken many discrete steps to tighten, incrementally to be sure, but tighten nonetheless, OMB control over the agencies, the information or data quality guidelines the peer review guidelines, circular A4 for regulatory analyses, the risk assessment bulletin, and now the bulletin on good guidance practices, all of which are described in my written testimony. Now each step, standing on its own, can be justified or defended, and none standing on its own warrants the outrage that was directed at them by the critics of the administration at the same time the cumulative effect has been overwhelming on the agencies and there is a dramatically different dynamic between the agencies and the White House than there was at the end of the Clinton administration. In Executive Order 12866, President Clinton continued the practice of centralized review of rulemakings by OIRA. But at the same time, he reaffirmed the primacy of the agencies which are the repositories of significant expertise and experience and the entities to which Congress has delegated the authority to issue rules that have the force and effect of law. Today, those same agencies have at least one arm tied behind their backs, two 10-pound bricks tied to their ankles, and they're set on an obstacle course to navigate 
before they can issue any regulations. Forgive me for mangling my metaphors, but the combination of all the multiple mandates that OMB has imposed on the agencies makes it so much more difficult for them to do their job. Oversight is one thing. I'm talking of presidential oversight. But burdening the agencies to slow them down or destroy their morale is something else. Now, I have heard that there's nothing new in the executive order. It's all business as usual. It's simply what the Clinton administration had done. That is not the case. This is a dramatically different environment and a dramatically different thrust. Um, and I can go into detail if you would like during questions. It's also the one explanation that was given when the executive order was issued had to do with increasing transparency and producing better decisions. That simply is not credible. Look at the way it was done. There was no consultation or explanation. Look at the effect it has on the agencies coming on the heels of the many mandates that OMB has imposed on them. And look at the message it sends. Regulations to protect the environment or to promote the health and safety of American people are disfavored. Let the market, not the government, do it. Executive Order 12866, as originally drafted, was neutral as to process, even though President Clinton was highly supportive of regulations as part of the solution to serious problems plaguing our society, the executive order was not skewed to achieve a pro-regulatory result. It was not a codification of a pro-regulatory philosophy or ideology. It was on its face and by intent a charter for good government without any predetermination of outcomes. Simply stated, the agency's regulations would be debated on the merits not preordained by the process through which they were developed and issued. In light of the actions taken over the last six years by the Bush administration, that is no longer the case with Executive Order 12866 as amended. Each step in the process of extending presidential control over the agencies has placed a thumb on the scale. By now, we have a whole fist influencing the outcome. Thank you so much for holding this hearing. It is important for Congress to let the executive know that it takes these matters seriously and is deeply concerned about the implications of their recent actions on the integrity of the administrative process. Thank you, Ms. Cass and uh, Mr. Vladek. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Sensenbrenner, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here to testify before you today. I've submitted a detailed uh, uh, testimony outlining my major concerns with the new ex executive order. So I'd like to use my five minutes to outline some of my most pressing concerns. Uh, let me begin with the bad news. Uh, the bad news is this. Our regulatory process, and particularly our health and science agencies, have been stretched to the breaking point. Agency budgets have been slashed. Agency staffing levels have been cut to the bone. Agency scientists have been demoralized by the blatant politicization of science, and not surprisingly, our agencies are fraying at the seams. It now takes OSHA a decade, a decade, to issue standards to protect workers from occupational safety and health threats. The FDA, long the gold standard of our health and safety agencies, has experienced substantial regulatory failure. Defective medical devices, unsafe drugs, slip uh, slip by the FDA and onto our markets. Uh, we are now reaping what we have sown. Under-resourced, under-funded, over-politicized agencies that can't do their job of protecting us. But these are the very agents on, agencies on which we depend to ensure that the food we eat is pure, the drugs we take are safe and effective, that the air we breathe is clean, and that our workplaces are not unreasonably dangerous. Now, this is an executive order. And that means something. It is not simply a trivial statement of business as usual. Presidents use executive orders to mark important and dramatic steps uh, in terms of the way they organize the executive branch. And Executive Order 13422 is no different. It takes a number of steps that are problematic and which Congress ought to take a very careful look at. The first uh, problem with the executive order that I see uh, 
is that it usurps congressional authority by directing agencies to justify regulatory action on the basis of market failure. And make no mistake, an agency, particularly if it's developing a regulation or guidance that OR redeems significant, is going to have to do business with market failure. To be sure, there is an escape valve left in the executive order. But that escape valve is operative at OIRA's insistence, not the agencies. And so agencies, if they want to get their rules approved, they want to go ahead with guidance, they are going to have to at least do business with OIRA on market failure basis. Uh, the problem with this, of course, is that, as Sally has just said, agencies have been given uh, just an enormous number of analytic requirements that they have to uh, they have to navigate through in order to take regulatory action. Now, not simply binding regulatory action, but non-binding regulatory action. The executive branch seems to think that there is no limit to the number of analytical requirements that they can impose on the process. This process is already broken, and putting another straw on the camel's back is going to further undermine the ability of agencies to deliver the protection that Congress has decreed they, they deliver to us. Uh, the second, uh, the expansion of OIRA's authority to guidance documents makes no sense. Guidance documents by their nature are non-binding. The courts have been very clear in holding that a guidance document does not impose a binding requirement on a regulated industry. There's, there are arguments to be made about whether centralized review is a good idea or not. I disagree with my colleague, Sally. I've always thought centralized review was bad, whether practiced by Republicans or Democrats, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, but this is, this, uh, this is a, a, a completely unwarranted step, and oddly a step that's going to hurt regulated business. Mr. Sensenbrenner, you talked about small business. Small businesses need guidance from agencies about how to comply with federal mandates. Now, if they pick up a phone and call a regulatory officer at, at, uh, at the FDA, for example, they're going to have to say, wait, I've got to do a market failure analysis before I can give you guidance? That kind of interaction is covered by this executive order. You are handcuffing the ability of our agencies to interact with the people they regulate. And interposing OIRA between them is not sound government policy. The last point I want to make is this. I am very troubled by, and I would urge Congress to take a hard look at this, the executive order requiring a presidential appointee to run the regulatory offices at the agencies. If you look, and, and here I, I hate to do this because I have such respect for Mr. Copeland, but if you, and, and I disagree with him on this point, if you look at the way the agencies structure their regulatory compliance, in many agents, particularly at the sub-cabinet level, the regulatory officers are political but not presidential appointees, but they're experts in regulation. They know the details, the arcane aspects of our regulatory process that now is all enveloping. To force the agency to find another employee, a presidentially appointed person who may or may not be subject to Senate confirmation is bad policy and is a threat to Congress. Because when you give an agency authority to exercise regulatory power, you delegate that authority not to the agency. The statute doesn't read, we ask the Department of Transportation to do something. You tell the Secretary of Transportation to do it. Why? because that person is accountable to you as well as the president. I am fearful that this executive order seeks to end run that kind of accountability that Congress has always demanded. Uh, I see my time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vladek. Um, Mr. Kovacs, I wasn't paying attention. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member okay. Sensenbrenner. It's really a privilege to uh, be here today and, and to discuss uh, oversight issues with federal agencies. Um, the Chamber cares about this issue pro probably more than any other issue. Uh, the regulatory mill, contrary to what's been stated, has not stopped. There are about 110,000 regulations out there right now. There are 4,000 new regulations a year. The cost to the American economy is about 
$1 trillion. And to put it in perspective, there are only $857 billion paid in individual income taxes and another $226 billion in corporate taxes. So it's one significant mandate. It costs small business about 45% more than it costs a large business to comply with it. So the regulatory mill and the regulation mill um, hasn't stopped. Executive Order 13422, you know, there's a lot of hyperbole and a lot of rancor about this, but this executive order contains nothing that hasn't been contained in an executive order since the presidency of Richard Nixon. And through Richard Nixon with his quality of life and Jimmy Carter with his uh, his regulatory reform, right through Reagan and, and Bush and Clinton, have all issued something like this. And it's, a, it's an attempt by the administrations uh, to get some management structure in the agencies. Because what does it ask them to do? It asks them to, ask to state a purpose for the rule. It asks that they have a, cu a cumulative cost benefit, which is some people would say is new, but it actually came in in Carter's time and to have a regulatory uh, uh, appointment. That also came in in Carter's time. And during this same 30-year time period, it hasn't been as if the agencies were just off, where the executive was off trying to manage the agencies. Congress has gone through the Regulatory Flexibility Act, where you've asked the agencies every seven years to come back and talk about the regulations that should be eliminated, or Sabrifa with congressional review, or negative regu or, or reg negs. You can go through a whole list. This has been a bipartisan effort for 30 years, and it's an attempt to manage. Um, the good guidance practices, uh, yeah, we did comment on it, and most of the comments were very positive. But what does it ask the public to do? It asks, it asks the public and the agencies that if you have a significant guidance document, and some of these guidance documents are very significant because on top of the 110,000 regulations, you have several tens of thousands of, of guidance documents. What does it ask them to do? It says if it's got significant guidance of general applicability to the entire regulated community, what should you do? You should put it on your website. That's corrupting government. You should put it on your website and allow the public to comment. You should give them a list of documents and put it on your website so that the public knows what the guidance is. Everyone feels sorry. Oh, the poor small business can't, can't speak to a regulatory officer. That's foolish. They, it's got to be of general applicability, and it requires notice and comment on, on the website. The second part of it is, if it's an economically significant rule, which imposes costs of $100 million or more, then they have to put a notice in the Federal Register, and they have to accept comments from the public. I, I don't know that these are huge burdens, but, but what it does do is it opens up the, 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 the transparency. Think about it. You're a small business in North Carolina and you've got a set of regulations that are four feet long and six feet high going up to the ceiling, and you have to deal with health issues, pensions, pensions uh, environmental issues, OSHA issues, and everything else. You've got to deal with it every day, and you have 10 employees. And so what, what this is doing is it's making the process more transparent, and it's putting, yes, a political figure, someone who works for the President of the United States, who is the Executive Officer of the United States, and is trying to manage a government that he really has a very difficult time controlling. There are all these buildings that you look at with all these regulations coming out of these buildings. And what is he asking the political officer to do? He's saying, look, I've got a policy here. I want regulations that have some compliance with my executive orders. Would you tell me if the agency is, is not going to comply with my executive order? I don't think that that's an unreasonable request. And then finally, over the years, the courts have been very clear on executive orders and, and, and guidance documents. I mean, in the guidance documents, Appalachia Power, the, the D.C. Court of Appeals, made it very clear. If it's got the force and effect of law, it's a regulation, whether you call it guidance or regulation. All this executive order is trying to do is say, it doesn't matter whether it's guidance or regulation. Let's have the public have the right to, to comment. And then finally, even on the, the, the scope of the executive order, the courts have dealt with these for years since Harry Truman and the steel seizure case. If, it, if, if, the, if the president's legislating, uh, then it's unconstitutional. If the president is managing government, uh, then it's within his prerogative. And I think that this is, I, I really thank you for having this hearing because I think that having a discussion over the role of agencies in government is really crucial and I think you're doing a great service to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kovacs. The uh, chair on behalf of the subcommittee welcomes that endorsement. Uh, Dr. Melberth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've heard testimony about the executive order amendment, so I'd like to focus my comments on the tools of the regulatory process um, that Mr. Vladek referred to. Um, a great deal of attention has been given to things like cost-benefit analysis, risk assessment, 
peer review, federal advisory committees um, have been the focus of more recent attention. The administration has consistently used regular, regulatory tools like risk assessment, peer reviews, and federal advisory committees to manipulate science for its own ends, attempted to impose a one-size-fits-all framework on the agency's use of these tools, and has shifted the criteria for defining when regulations are necessary away from a health and safety problem and toward a market-based criteria. Cost-benefit analysis is often touted by the administration and conservative think tanks as a neutral tool in policymaking, but recent studies by legal scholars show that the CBA is inherently political. There are several shortcomings in the way CBA is used, and these deficiencies have been exacerbated by actions during the Bush administration. A second regulatory tool that OIRA tried to manipulate was the use of risk assessments. In January 2006, John Graham issued OMB's proposed risk assessment bulletin, which contained a set of one-size-fits-all guidelines to govern all risk assessments and included technical standards for all federal agencies to use when conducting risk assessments as well as other scientific documents. The National Research Council's review of the bulletin called for its withdrawal. The, rebu the rebuke by the NRC is one of the strongest commentaries issued on a trend over the last six years to centralize power over the regulatory process. The strongly worded NRC evaluation should provide a Congress interested in executive oversight with a strong example of the dangers of this regulatory trend. OMB again attempts a one-size-fits-all approach that doesn't consider different agency functions and expertise required to implement legislation in its use of peer review. OMB is a political office working directly for the administration, not an unbiased scientific office. Yet the agency places itself in the role of supervisor for implementing scientific peer review. The science community has often argued that by appointing people from the regulated industries as members of federal advisory committees, as the Bush administration has consistently done, the advice the committees offer to an agency might create real dangers to public health and safety. This is one example of the growing influence of regulated industries in the rulemaking process. Like the tools discussed above, Federal advisory committees specifically and the processes in which they are used are being manipulated to achieve results desired by political considerations, not science, health, safety, or environmental protection. OMB Watch has several concerns about the trends in the regulatory process that have occurred over the last few decades, such as the reduced governmental role, devolving responsibility to the states, and privatization. The Bush administration has further reduced the role of the federal government's general welfare protections by putting special interest concerns above the general public's concerns. There has been a sustained attack on scientific integrity, on the quality of scientific information, on the scientific expertise of agency professionals, and on the integrity of the scientific process. The tools have been manipulated, and the executive order amendments just issued, coupled with the Good Guidance Practices Bulletin, have further established control of the regulatory process in the executive branch, and OIRA especially, at the expense of both congressional power and agency discretion. The real loser, however, is the public. In the end, less regulation means less protection. Every year, more than 40,000 people die on our nation's highways. Foodborne illnesses kill an estimated 5,000 and sicken 76 million. Nearly 6,000 workers die as a result of injury on the job, with an additional 50 to 60,000 killed by occupational disease. And asthma, linked to air pollution, is rising dramatically afflicting 17 million, including 6 million children. I want to leave you with just one example of the danger of this regulatory process. The Transportation Recall Enhancement and Accountability and Documentation Act, TREAD, passed by Congress in November 2000, required that, quote, the Secretary of Transportation shall complete a rulemaking for a regulation to require a warning system in new motor vehicles to indicate to the operator when a tire, when a tire is significantly underinflated. Yet the tire pressure alert system regulations that were significantly, that were required by law to be in place by the end of 2000 have not been adequately developed, although the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration determined in its rulemaking that a direct tire pressure monitoring system should be installed in new vehicles. But OMB sent a letter to NHTSA after meeting with the auto industry directing, deciding that the direct system was inappropriate claiming its cost-benefit calculations provided a basis for delaying the, the requirement of the direct systems. The final rule issued May 2002 would have allowed lawmakers 
I'm sorry, would have allowed automakers to install ineffective tire pressure monitoring systems and would have left many drivers unaware of the dangerously underinflated tires. NHTSA was sued because its final rule would have allowed manufacturers to choose to install either an effective direct system or an inferior indirect system. In August 2003, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit ordered NHTSA to rewrite the rule because NHTSA acted in an arbitrary and capricious manner by writing a standard that would allow installation of a clearly faulty indirect system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time's up. Uh, thank all of you. There are only two members here. Uh, so we will, uh, the rules do allow waiving the five minute limits to some extent. And um, Mr. Mr. Sensenbrenner has uh, graciously offered to help teach me how to be a chairman. Um, That's called push the button when somebody starts speaking. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, well, I do. I do have questions that won't actually, won't actually, last five minutes. Actually, so did so did I. Okay. <laughs> um, so the chairman, you go first. Right. Um, Mr. Kovacs um, and Mr. Vladek's uh, testimony, his written testimony, um, he said that the role of OIRA, OIRA was a one-way ratchet. It always resulted in weaker. Uh, propose, uh, pro in weaker regulations. Um, Dr. Melberth cited one example, um, the gauge on tire pressure uh, where OIRA had, their role had resulted in a weaker regulation that was overturned by the courts. Uh, can you give examples of when agencies have sent proposed rules to OIRA in the last six years during the Bush administration where the Bush administration has sent back the rule and said, this is not tough enough. Uh, this, we really need to do more to protect public health, to protect safety, uh, to protect the environment, to protect privacy rights or civil rights or whatever. Uh, can you cite examples of when OIRA has sent uh, regulations back to the agency that, that, uh, from which they came and said, make it stronger? I don't have any list of, of the rules that they've sent back to the agencies, and I don't even know that one is public. I do know that the first year and a half when John Green was head of OIRA, he did uh, send a number of rules back, and I believe one of them uh, was the particulate matter rule. So I, the first couple of years, about 18 months, he did it, and then for some reason it, it all of a sudden stopped. They weren't, they weren't sending as many back, but it was a standardized process during that time period. Ms. Kansen, are you aware of circumstances in the last six years that uh, OIRA has sent regulations back and asked the agency to toughen them up? No, I am not. The uh, return letters are public because they're posted on the website, and I think OIRA has, under uh, the Bush administration, has increased the transparency and greater use of the website for that purpose. Uh, I've read all of the return letters, and I have not seen any uh, requiring, requesting, uh, entreating greater protection or more stringent, um, uh, achieving better benefits. Mr. Vladek, you, you obviously won't answer. The statistics are public, um, and in fact, uh, Curtis Copeland uh, uh, of the CRS has published an article uh, in the 33 Fordham Urban Law Journal, which discusses all of the statistics which are public since 1994 including those from 2000 to 2005, you'll see there are an awful lot of return letters. Um, there are a lot of changes made. One of the categories uh, are consistent with change. Those are changes pushed by OIRA. Uh, and the numbers are quite large. And I look at the return letters, as does uh, Ms. Katzen. I've never seen one return to beef up the rule in a way that would protect the public health. Okay. Ms. Kasson, you uh, obviously were, uh, played an important role in the Clinton administration in drafting the original um, Executive Order 12866, uh, and you spoke a moment ago of transparency uh, in the role of OIRA, uh, and I understand that transparency was part of that executive order. Uh, it required communications between the agencies and OIRA to be public, subject to the FOIA request. Um, it required, as I understand it, any changes of the return letters uh, uh, to be public as well, uh, and, I, and communications between OIRA and, and outside agencies 
um, who were urging a change in the rules, uh, whether it's a, uh, entirely proper um, urging of an agent of, of an industry to say this is unworkable, uh, but it, it made those communications uh, public so that the, the public could decide whether any changes that OIRA made uh, were appropriate uh, or uh, in, in an appropriate response to legitimate concerns raised by those most familiar with what the, what the agencies would do. Uh, what, what the regulations would do, or or whether it was caving to pressure, um, is that essentially are the, those that there were a number transparency of provisions? Yes, I mean uh, Mr. Kovacs talked about going back to Richard Nixon, and I I do discuss this in my written testimony. Um, President Reagan took a dramatic step forward. And that was highly controversial because it was opaque at best. It was just not transparent. When we drafted 12866, we were highly sensitive to that and wanted to make sure that we met that one head on. In fact, it was in part because members of Congress had spoken out so forcefully calling for openness and accountability that we responded by including the provisions that you mentioned in the executive order. That's the role that I think Congress should have, which is to um, make sure that the executive is aware that there are, is, uh, are two branches of government involved, since it's the Congress that delegates to the agencies in the first instance the authority to regulate. Um, the other comment, if I may, sir, um, the, the thought that we that this is simply a logical progression from what the Clinton administration did cannot be substantiated. I was there for six years. I never saw a guidance document. I never asked to see a guidance document. The, the concept that this is just business as usual and, you know, President Clinton did it, he might as well do it too, just couldn't be further from the truth. Thank you. I have more questions, but I will save them for a later round. Um, Mr. Sinsenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, let me put on the record that the executive order that President Bush issued amending uh, Executive Order 12866 was signed on January 18, 2007, just 28 days ago. <laughs> So the process that we are talking about and the issuance of the regulations are all done pursuant to Clinton's executive order because I don't think there have been any major regulations that have been issued as a result of the amendment. Uh, the amendment uh, of the president's most recent executive order talks about process. It doesn't talk about the bottom line of the regulation. And uh, I guess I would kind of like to find out why three of the four witnesses did not send any in any comments relative uh, to the amendment when it was under consideration. Um, if I may, uh, executive orders are not typically put out for notice and comment. The comments that were filed were filed on the good guidance document mm -hmm. rather than on the amendment to the executive so order. I, I stand corrected on that, but um, uh, uh, where the comments were solicited and received, uh, Mr. Kovacs uh, uh, had some input on it, but none of the other three of you did, and why is that? Uh, he represents a, a, an entity that is an interested uh, participant. I'm an academician, and I write oh. scholarly articles unless I'm asked to testify in Congress. Well, I, I think you're them. really interested in that, given what I've heard you say. Uh, I am very interested, okay. yes, sir. Uh, okay. But you didn't comment. Now, Mr. Vladek? Uh, the two organizations with which I am affiliated did comment, Public Citizen and OMB Watch. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on the board of directors of, of OMB Watch, and I still have a, a relationship with Public Citizen. They both did comment. I did not personally comment on the guy. Okay. Dr. Milberth. Mr. Simpson-Burner, we did submit um, comments on the proposed GPP bulletin mm -hmm. um, under Citizens for Sensible Safeguard. It's signed by members of uh, the mm -hmm. coalition that we lead, mm -hmm. um, and my predecessor as Director of Regulatory Policy was one of those signees. Yeah. You know, now, you know, with respect to market failure or using market forces, 
uh, the Regulatory Reform Act that was signed by President Clinton and was a part of the contract with America and passed by Congress in 1995 uh, did require cost-benefit analyses to be applied during the regulatory process. Uh, do you think that was a good idea? I'll start with you, Dr. Melberth. Yes, sir. I think cost-benefit analysis is an appropriate tool to be used, okay. not Robotic. as a I don't believe centralized review is a good idea to begin with, and requiring all agencies to do cost-benefit analysis, even for significant rules, in my view, is a bad idea. Okay, Ms. Katzen. I'm a proponent of cost-benefit analysis as an input to decision-making, not as dispositive of the outcome. Now, do you think that the cost-benefit analysis should be just as transparent as some of the other things that you've testified on, so that the public and perhaps the Congress can see if there is a proposed regulation that has about this much benefit at that much cost? Yes, and in fact, during the Clinton administration, there were many occasions when the cost-benefit analysis was higher, more paper, more analysis than actually the rulemaking to provide the kind of information that people should have. It is also very important to emphasize Agencies are not free agents. They are able to regulate only because Congress has delegated them the power to do so. But the and agencies had are headed by someone who is appointed by the President of the United States. Absolutely. All I'm saying is that we had several instances while I was the administrator of OIRA where on the basis of a cost-benefit analysis, we saw that the costs were larger than the benefits, but that the Congress had given us no discretion and that we had to proceed. In at least one instance, we made that finding loud and clear and sent a letter to the Congress saying, please amend the law so we don't have to do that. And Congress did. It does work. Yes, I it should work. Yes. I go back to balance my time. Thank you, Mr. Sisson. Mr. Bayard. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, Dr. Melbert, if you were going to continue your thought. I'd like to ask you if you'd like to do that earlier. You were asked a question by Mr. Sensenbrenner and gave a partial answer. We're in the middle of continuing. you care to elaborate? Thank you, Mr. Baird. Um, I do think cost-benefit analysis is uh, a good thing to have as part of the decision-making process. I have several problems with cost-benefit analysis, um, but however it's used, it should only be one aspect uh, of that decision-making process. It should not be dispositive. It should not be um, the, the driving mechanism, in my opinion, in that decision-making process, which does not, if you use cost-benefit analysis as dispositive, include any of the non-quantifiable aspects that are so often underestimated in cost-benefit analysis. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your expansion on that point. If uh, I'm a little puzzled by the, one of the core issues here, and it has to do with this uh, market, uh, market process, uh, apparently, the, the issue is that we don't need regulations if the market would already regulate itself. And I, I, I'm just puzzled. I'm completely puzzled about how one operationalizes that. I don't know that the marketplace in general, as currently structured, incentivizes uh, many industries to engage in responsible behavior, except their fiduciary responsibility to their stockholders. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I, I don't think the market intrinsically is designed to protect workers, public health, environmental issues. Uh, so if any of you care to enlighten me about what the heck this means, and, and if, it's, if it's the metric by which OMB or other executive branch offices are going to evaluate regulations, I'd sure like to operationalize that metric. Uh, you want me to try this one? Uh, the concept is that regulations uh, will be necessary where there is a failure uh, of the marketplace. Uh, and the terms that are often thrown around are externalities, lack of information, market power. Uh, if, you can, if you're an agency, you can demonstrate that there are one of these externalities, market power, lack of information, then you're kind of home free. The point I think some of us were making is that there are often good reasons for regulations that do not involve market failures. 
where the market can be functioning absolutely the way a market should, and I'm thinking in areas such as civil rights or privacy, where market failure is irrelevant to the underlying issue and there's a need for something to be done. The way the original executive order was drafted, it was an instruction to the agency to identify the problem that you were trying to address. Parenthetically, was it attributable to a market failure or something else? Close parentheses, and how you plan to fix it. Now it's, tell us about the market failure. And maybe it's a failure of a public institution, and then go on and worry about the rest of it. It's a different emphasis on a different syllable. It comes out different. And that's what I'm reacting to, I think. Let me, let me jump in. Um, the best way to understand the pitfalls of this is just look at the, at, at the regulation of airbags. Uh, Detroit waged what the Supreme Court called the regulatory equivalent of war to, uh, to forestall regulatory and congressional action requiring the installation of airbags. So if you talk about market failure, where exactly is the market failure? People are still buying cars. And even once GM, which was the first company to introduce airbags, started to introduce them, uh, they sold them as an add-on, not as part of the car. They were very expensive. Um, and uh, even today, when you have certain kinds of airbags, some of the side curtain airbags that are um, you know, they're not required by federal law. Uh, the marketing of them is done in, in, in you know, in, for the American companies. Uh, they're add-ons. They're very expensive add-ons. Now, is the market working? The, the introduction of airbags in the United States was delayed for about 15 years because of the battle that industry fought to keep airbags off the market. And provided that no one was offering them, they weren't suffering any economic consequence. Now, if you look at the, the new executive order, it substitutes the question that was from the Reagan executive order carried forward through the Clinton executive order, which is, tell us, tell OIRA why it is you want to regulate. That's all you've got to do. Now, let me just read you what the new executive order substitutes in its place. It says, each agency shall identify in writing the specific market failure that warrants the new rule. Uh, the word shall is a word of command. It's not if you feel like it. And so what, what this change to the executive order does is it places the lens of the agency and OIRA on market failure. Yes, there's an escape clause. You'll hear a lot about that. But it's a substitute for market failure analysis. And OIRA, not the agency, ultimately calls the shots. Let me, let me see if I could uh, take a crack at it, because we've, we've talked about market failure quite a few times, and one of the advantages of not being a law professor is the only thing I know is what I read. And what the statement says is, each agency shall identify in writing, as the professor suggests, specific market failure. But then it says, such as externalities, market power, lack of information, or other specific, or another specific problem that it intends to address, again brackets, including where applicable the failure of public institutions that warrant new agency action, as well as the ability to assess the significance of the problem. So it's not just market failure; it's a variety of failures that might occur. I think it goes back to the simple concept that was raised 35 years ago, which is tell us what the problem is and tell us how you're trying to address it. I, I don't think we can impute that this is only just market failure when they give all of that other uh, explanatory language. My, my question is that, that that sounds nice, but if someone actually wishes to use the, uh, the language as a smokescreen to push a different agenda, uh, that's where the rub is. Uh, if, if we were all well-intentioned, sincere, honest, earnest people with a similar shared value set and agenda set, I don't know that there'd be a problem. My concern is, does the rewrite, and I think some of the other witnesses seem to be hinting at it, saying pretty directly, the problem is that this new language puts the onus and the decision-making in a different area than it used to be, and that that opens the door for potential uh, shenanigans and, and, and actions contrary to the public interest. That, that's my read of it. I guess, you know, 
that there are theoretical ways to look at, at the regulatory process, and we went over, you know, what it looks like from a small business point of view. But, you know, if, if it were up to the chamber, you know, we don't just want peer review. We want open peer review so that we can have all the brilliance, brilliant minds comment on it. We want complete transparency because we think that that's the easiest way to deal with the agencies. Unfortunately, we're in a political situation and the agencies have always, uh, have always opposed that much transparency. So I think what you have here is a very practical situation. You have one president of the United States who is responsible for the executive branch of government and he has to have some management authority. This president has decided through the executive order and through these guidance documents that this is the kind of transparency he has. We participate in that process. Are we happy with it all the time? No, but I don't think you can, as, as some of the panelists suggest that there's some manipulation here or something sinister. The regulatory process this is extremely complicated. There are a lot of laws and a lot of people trying to work this process. All we've ever asked when we get through on these kind of situations is that we have some mechanism if the problem isn't addressed and assessed that we can get back into the process. And I think Mr. Cole, I appreciate very much insight. If I could ask just one last question. When Vice President Cheney was drafting the energy policy, he invited a number of folks, I think from oil and gas to the White House. Many of us were curious as to who those folks were. From what you've just said, the Chamber of Commerce is very interested in transparency. Was it the Chamber's official position back then and is it now that the Vice President of the United States should share information about who consulted with him on energy policy? Our, 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 well, I don't know about any particular issue, but our policy has always been, and I, and I think there are logs out there as to who signs in. Certainly when I go over to any meeting over at the White House, I sign in, give my social security number, date of birth, and everything else. So that information should be there. If it were up to me, uh, personally, this isn't the chamber, I mean, I'd have all schedules of all public officials open. To well, for, well, for the record, then, I would just request that you would report back to this committee uh, on a conversation. I'll ask you to have a conversation with your leadership of the organization, and if that is the case, if there's a consistency of value here that we want open public information, please send us a letter which we will convey to the Vice President asking him on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce to share the names I, of the people who helped draft this energy policy. I wasn't addressing it to any particular policy. What I, what I said, just so my words, is we think that government in general should be open. I agree with that entirely. What I'm saying is it may be a fairly selective belief. If that's your belief, I don't know how many things are more important in this country than our energy policy, and if that's your belief, share that belief with us and apply it equitably across, not just to this particular proposed regulation, but equitably across the activities of the executive branch, and we will convey that the Chamber of Commerce formally believes the Vice President of the United States, consistent with this policy of openness advocated by the Chamber of Commerce, shares with the American public the names of the people who developed this energy policy. Just, just so we're on the same, I'm very willing to go back and, 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 and make that request, just so we're sure it's going to be a general statement how you use it is, is completely up to you. All right. I'll look we would to hope that you would extend that to all of the other agencies and how all the other rules like PM and ozone and everything right. else are made. Okay. Mr. Kovacs, Mr. Baird, I am, I am struggling to continue to chair this uh, the subcommittee meeting without the tutelage of Mr. Sensenbrenner, um, but we, do, we will have time for a second round of questions, although I understand the Judiciary Committee uh, has claimed this room beginning at, at 2 o'clock. I did have a couple of questions uh, before turning to Mr. Warbacher, um, kind of on the doctrine of hot pursuit uh, about this, uh, the, the, the um, market failure issue. Uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner said that in 1995, Congress passed and the President signed regulatory reform legislation that did place into law cost-benefit analysis. Um, Mr. Vladek, you're shaking your head no to that, uh, but does, does market failure appear in statute? Is that, is that a criterion for the approval of, of, of regulations or for a, a regulatory agency to act or not to act uh, that Congress has ever placed into federal law? Ms. Katzen. Not that I'm aware of. I think what uh, uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner was referring to was the Unfunded Mandates Act, which refers to an analysis of the costs and the benefits, and there is no mention no mention of market failure in that or in SBIFRA, the Small Business Regulatory Flexibility Act, which was also passed at that time, nor in the Congressional Review Act, which was another product 
uh, of that uh, Congress. So uh, it is not legislative language, sir. Okay. That is consistent with my understanding as well. And, and the Unfunded Mandates Act is a limited statute. It doesn't require cost-benefit analysis across the board. Mr. Kovacs, do you... Again, I'm not reading it as just market. Is that is that being the only criteria? I mean, I just don't think the language gets you there. Okay. Mr. Vladek, in his written testimony, uh, said that the... Uh, the woman appointed or nominated to be chair or to head the OIRA, uh, Susan Dudley, uh, who I have never met and I have not read her writings, but um, uh, strongly believes that the market seldom fails, that there is almost always a market mechanism that corrects any societal ill. Um, if we now place into uh, the regulatory framework, a criterion not established by Congress uh, that is going to be administered by someone who, who believes apparently, or according to Mr. Vladek, um, almost as dogma that the market seldom, if ever, fails. Uh, Mr. Kovacs, is, is that the distribution of authority between the branches of government you think the framers of the Constitution intended? Well, well first of all, being a... Uh, we're having worked on the Hill for years, I, I, I am uh, a very fervent believer personally in, in the prerogatives of the Congress as a separate branch of, of government. And the agencies have a constitutional obligation to implement the laws as, as you pass them. And granted, within that, there is some discretion based on a lot of different factors, whether it be uh, budget or personnel or how, how it is. But I'm not, you know, I'm not here saying market failure is the only criteria. There are other criteria here which I would hope that the agency would recognize. I'm taking the position that I read it as that the agency has to identify because of all of these different uh, conditions what the specific reason is that they're, in, that they're going to move forward with the regulation, not that it can only be market failure because obviously there are reasons you would I implement a regulation other than market failure, civil rights for example. Mr. Long, do you want, wish to address that? Yeah, I, let, let me just use as an example the uh, the upgraded airbag rule, which Ms. Dudley was virtually alone in opposing. Uh, as you know, when Congress required the introduction of airbags, it did not set performance standards. And as a consequence, the first generation of airbags uh, were very inexpensive and not as effective as they should have been. Congress told NHTSA to go, to go out and to improve the quality of airbags that are available to the American people. Ms. Dudley's uh, comments opposing the revisions to the airbag standard uh, took the position quite strongly that market failure had not been shown by NHTSA, uh, by NHTSA the agency, and therefore the agency shouldn't proceed. Uh, the reason why I think this is germane is that phrases like market failure can mean different things to different people. And if the administrator of OIRA can block a significant rule or return a significant rule, because she believes that the agency has not made a case for market failure. It gives OIRA a tool to block uh, important developments to protect the public safety and health. I, I do want to preserve time for another round of questions, and that was not one of my rounds, by the way. Um, Mr. Rohrbacher. But my pressure. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's get to be, this obviously goes to the way we look at things fundamentally and not there's a fundamental philosophical issue and whether how that philosophy relates to reality and how it impacts on people's lives and let me note that people who do believe in the market uh, are not just philosophizers we believe in the end uh, it means that people's lives will be better off uh, uh, some fundamental questions then apply here uh, we must note fundamentally that at times it is difficult to determine uh, exactly what the public interest is. Uh, this is not where there is an omnipotent group of uh, uh, people who are commanded by God to, uh, who understand exactly what the public interest is, whether or not resources should go, for example, uh, into airbags, or whether or not resources should go someplace else. And uh, I think it's somewhat of a, uh, uh, to the degree that we are talking about public assets, 
the air, the water, the soil, then we need to sit down and determine for the public how those publicly held assets will be, you know, will be used. And regulation and uh, certainly government intervention in those areas is justified. But in terms of how much the public is willing to pay for their safety or something else that they might want, they might want a higher proportion of this as compared to what the regulators think is best for them. And uh, that's one issue that I would like to, uh, to uh, throw on the table. Uh, another thing, let me note that uh, my observation over the years has been that every time that we have people who move forward uh, in a regulatory process in the name of protecting uh, the, the general public, uh, quite often they are influenced by special interest groups. And the, the more, the further away from the consumer and the further where they have choice in the matter or by elected officials, who are by their very nature uh, dependent on the, on the voters and, or, or the consumers to approve of the job they've done, uh, once you go to a regulatory approach, it becomes less responsive to the public need and more responsive to people who can work their way into the regulatory process, meaning people who can hire the lobbyists down here who know the system and especially the system that happens in a regulatory process. So uh, I just thought I would throw those ideas out. Uh, let me uh, just ask your, uh, maybe we could have it from both sides of the spectrum here on, on your uh, analysis of what I just said or your reaction. Um. First of all, the, the use of willingness to pay as a, a measure of public interest to determine um, to determine the yeah. relative costs. Yeah, a car, a car uh, you know, may, people may well be willing to spend uh, uh, more money for an airbag in a car, but they may not. They may not. It may deter people from buying new cars. It may leave the poor people uh, on the outs because they don't have any airbags in their cars, and uh, et cetera. So, would would uh, by the way, let, let's let's get into that. Would you mandate that all cars be retrofitted with airbags? Isn't that uh, uh, wouldn't that be something if you have the public interest? And why don't you do that? You don't do it because there's a cost factor. If there's a cost factor with with older cars, why is that cost factor not important with newer cars? So, just thought. Go right ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Well, what I understand by the willingness to pay is the use of that in, in some kind of cost economic assessment. And the problem with using that kind of willingness to pay is it puts people in a hypothetical situation of trying to judge the risks that they face. Right. That seems to be highly unrealistic. And if you, if you um, put people in a situation in which they're actually faced with a danger, a drowning child, are they going to jump and save the child? Of course they are. Right. There are those kinds of situations, and yet, you know, the willingness to pay doesn't go anywhere. Well, let's, let's, to go to, let's not go hypothetical. Let's go specifically. I have triplets. My wife had triplets. Everybody knows that. I'm a very proud father, and I want those kids safe. And I tell you, I am willing to pay the extra money for the gas to have a big, heavy car. Because when my wife goes to the market, I want to make sure if that car is hit, that they're safe. I'm willing to pay that extra. But mandating that the cars get much more miles a gallon and, and are much lighter, because they have to make it lighter, uh, shouldn't I, as a consumer, be able to do that rather than have a regulator make that decision for me? If I could come at this from a slightly different way. Sure. Uh, I don't have difficulty with the concepts that you're putting on the table. What I think is important is that when Congress legislates and then when the agency regulates, it take into account all of the different views. That's why the process of rulemaking under the Administrative Procedure Act, Section 553, and in reality, is a very open process. It's a process that features public participation, be it by special interests or by individuals who can contribute their views their philosophies, their approach, their data, their analyses to the issue. That's what rulemaking is all about, which 
which is why it takes months, sometimes years, to issue rules. The point I was trying to make earlier is that what I find troubling, deeply troubling, is if the process is skewed to come out one way or the other. If the process is neutral, let's hear your thoughts. Let's hear your information. We'll take into account all of these factors and we'll reach a judgment and be accountable for that judgment. Then I think it's appropriate. But if you've got, as I used the analogy earlier, a thumb or a fist, on the, on the scale, and you say, we're going to come out one way or the other, yeah. then you have squashed or well, squelched or whatever. Totally legitimate. Uh, I've, I've, obviously, you've made a legitimate point there, obviously. Let, let, me, let me try to respond as well, because I, I think I do disagree with your fundamental premise. I, I think it would be, at this point in time, you're responsible for government to permit the sale of motor vehicles, cars, to transport somebody else's triplets without airbags. I think that would be irresponsible. And frankly, you started by saying... Would you retrofit it? Would you I, I would, all cars be retrofitted? I wouldn't, and nor did, it's a, nor did Congress, when it decreed that cars have airbags, make that choice. Because ultimately, your question was, you know, who decides what's the public interest? You guys do. That's why we pay you the big box. And Congress decided, <laughs> Congress decided that there should be airbags. Now, the more difficult questions are what kinds of airbags and how much safety to, uh, to impose. And those are delicate questions of balancing. There are trade-offs there. If you want a safer car, all cars are not created equal. If you want to buy the safest car on the market for your triplets, there are better cars and there are less safe cars. And NHTSA has not gotten a mandate from Congress to require the maximum degree of safety no matter what. Those are the difficult trade-offs that you enlist expert agencies to help you. And what I'm concerned about is that the executive branch is handcuffing those agencies in their ability to do the public business. And let's talk about transparency. One of the odd things about the new executive order is the transparency and time limits are not required for guidance documents. OIRA can sit on a guidance document for five years consistent with this executive order. It can engage in all sorts of non-recorded contacts with respect to guidance documents under this executive order. This executive order goes back to the early days where OIRA was allowed to conduct a big part of its business in secret. And for someone who cares about openness, transparency, the way the markets ought to work, that's inimical to the way government ought to yeah. function. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rohrbacher. If you hang around for a minute, you may get another round of questions. But I'll, I want to pursue the, the discussion that we were just having about transparency and that, that I had begun in my earlier round of questions. Um, Mr. Kovacs, you spoke a great deal about transparency, openness of government, um, and, and seemed to take the pro position with respect to that, the, the, the position in favor of that. Um, all, the, all that Ms. Katzen described about uh, the earlier executive order by President Clinton, uh, the transparency, the, 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 the public availability of documents, uh, by uh, OIRA documents, their communications with the agency, their communications with outside uh, parties who are advocating for ch some change in the regulations, um, any changes in the regulations, you support um, all of those, uh, all those transparency requirements? Well, certainly. We've, um, well, I'll go, you know, one step further. <laughs> we've, we've actually were probably the primary <clears throat> advocates for the Information Quality Act, which is, which is going to, you know, turn everyone sort of bright red here. But, you know, what, what that says is, is that what the Congress ordered is that the agencies have to use the most accurate, up-to-date uh, in, information, and that if the information, if someone in the public believes that the information is incorrect, that they can file a petition to correct uh, the information. Again, you heard, heard the same arguments. This is trying to slow the agencies down. This is trying to put everything in secret. We've been very clear. We don't believe just in peer review. We believe in open peer review. Just open it up. Why should four or five scientists have, have a say over what the issue is? So when you come to the openness, the only way we're going to get the kind of information in into, from the public into the agency is if we know what the agency is doing and we're able to put it in. And that's what the guidance documents do, does. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kovacs. Uh, Ms. Katzen, um, under the new executive order, um, under the old executive order, OIRA was a gatekeeper, and now the gatekeeper has a gatekeeper. The, um, 
the public regulatory officers within each agency. Uh, all of the openness requirements with respect to oh, hours deliberations, uh, do those apply under the new executive order to the conduct of the uh, public regulatory officer? What are, what are the requirements for transparency at the agency level uh, for the gatekeeper's gatekeeper, the, um, the public regulatory officers? Those are not addressed in the executive order. Those would be uh, wholly dependent upon the agency's own internal rules for ex parte provisions, um, for disclosure, for uh, rulemaking, uh, as, as the case may be. Mr. Blodick, rather than write a note to Ms. Cass, I just want to answer yourself. <laughs> well, I mean, it's worse than that. I mean, not only does the executive order not apply, but the D.C. Circuit in a case that I helped lose many years ago called Webb versus HHS held that communications between officials at OMB and the agencies like the regulatory officer are presumptively not available under FOIA. So there is no, as far as I can see, there is no a mechanism by which we would be able to see what's going on at that stage of the development process, okay. which is a trouble. I think every Democratic member of Congress not in their first term has in their files letters from agencies explaining that FOIA does not reach pre-decisional discussions, internal agency documents, um, which presumably the, the involvement by the NPOs and the uh, RPO. RPOs, RPO. RPOs would, would fall within that, that exception. Uh, to FOIA, um, Mr. Kovacs, do you think the conduct of the regulatory public officers, the RPO, should be as tra transparent as the conduct, the involvement, uh, decision making by OIRA? If you're asking me, would we support an exempt? Would we support removing that exemption from FOIA? It, it's likely, but we would again, if we remove it for the entire process. Let me just give you really one example. For, for years, one of the biggest growth industries that's coming to the United States is nanotechnology. They expect in 10 years that to be a trillion plus uh, uh, revenue stream for the United States, a huge growth industry. Well, floating around EPA are some pre-decisional opinions on how EPA is going to regulate nanotech. Well, the business community is putting in an enormous amount of money as to, in, into, in, into nanotechnology, and we sent a FOIA letter, I don't know, six months, eight months ago, and we can't even get a little postcard from them. Uh, so it is a, it's a frustration that we all share, but if you're going to do it, rather than you know, picking on the vice president or picking on well, one... Looking specifically the at the, the, the regulatory public officers, uh, which, uh, who are now going to play an important role. I mean, the great, a great many regulations are never going to make it to OIRA. Uh, they will be smothered in the crib uh, at the agency by the RPO. Uh, and all the, all the requirements for transparency for OIRA appear not to apply to the RPOs. Well, so if, if, they're, if, if the decision, if the agency is making the wrong decision for the wrong reasons, we're not going to know about it. If OIRA makes the wrong decisions for the wrong reasons, we're going to know about it. And now a great many of agents of, of the uh, of the the regulations that the professional staff, the permanent professional staff, the experts, the scientists, the researchers at regulatory agencies are never going to make it past the gatekeeper's gatekeeper, and none of that will be public. Is that, isn't that right? I, I think it would be consistent. To, to directly answer your question, I think it would be consistent with the, the policies of the chamber that the entire agent, that that part, part of the entire agency process as to how a rule is made should be made public. And it wouldn't start, start just with the rule. It would start with the information that comes in, the studies that they rely on, uh, the risk assessments that they rely on. That entire process should be open. And, and the political officer, or the, the regulatory officer, is only, I'm sorry, is only the last person in line. And what I would suggest to you that if you're going to do that is, is that you start with what you know, the EPA Research Triangle Park does, which is let's look at the risk assessments. What's the basic information? And what we would say is rather than just taking one spot of the record, take the entire record because then, and that's what the Information Quality Act tried to do. It tried to say rather than starting at the end of the rulemaking process, which we're all fighting about today, start at the beginning. So because if the agency uses the wrong information in the, in the beginning, 
five years before the rule starts, Sally says 10, you know, that these processes can take 10 years. If you use the wrong information in the beginning, you're going to use the wrong information in the end. Okay. So open up the whole process. Uh, we, we really are just about out of time, and I apologize to Mr. Rohrbacher. We'll probably not be able to get to him for a second round of questions. Um, Ms. Katzen, Mr. Vladek, uh, Dr. Melberth, uh, do you think the same transparency requirements that apply to our IRS should apply to the agent, internal agency deliberations of the role of the RPO, uh, whether through changes to the executive order or through statutory change? I'm not going to answer your question directly because okay. um, I spent enough years at OMB to know that nothing is cost-free. And one of the points that Mr. Vladek made that I want to underscore is that the agencies have not only been required to do more analysis, more everything, but they've been given less funds. And when you say, shouldn't things be transparent, it's, even that's not cost-free. Putting up a website and maintaining it takes personnel, takes funds. Even if you outsource it, you've got to have a contractor, you got to update it every 15 days, it takes people, it takes time, it takes talent. And, and we have seen in the last, when I was at OMB, we had surpluses as far as the eye could see. Now we don't, and it's coming out of the agency's budget. And I think that's a real concern. So I can't truly answer your question. Okay. Mr. Bollock. I, I would agree. I think that you okay. have to make this process transparent. Okay. Dr. Melbourne. I would, also, I would also agree that that's something that OMB Watch has called for in most of these instances. Make this information public. It should be available. It should be accessible. Mr. Rohrbacher, you want to have one valedictory question? Right. Or <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, I'm very happy that when uh, – what year was that when you were saying we had the surpluses? I, <laughs> 1999. Yeah. I, I remember that. We Republicans were in solid control at that time, you know, here in the, here. In the House. Here. Yes. Uh, Not there. Right. <laughs> well, the, the, there you go. What's uh, analyzing stuff. Let me note that years ago uh, it was a consensus on global cooling. Now it's a consensus on global warming. The regulators always there, – there are things that – trends that, that could be true or not true that influence these benevolent and, and not profit-seeking regulators that we want to trust our lives to. Uh, one, for example, Mr. Chairman, a uh, decision that was made years ago by people I'm sure with very good hearts wanting to protect us all, uh, put severe restrictions on DDT, and now we have tens of millions of people in Africa who have lost their lives because DDT uh, is not eliminating the mosquito population, which which is plaguing them instead of us. There are there are unintended consequences at times that and and trendiness that affects regulators. I, uh, Mr. Chairman, could, uh, it doesn't seem to me that we have a real conflict. If you folks are advocating more scrutiny and openness uh, and, and focusing on this end of the process, and you have the Chamber of Commerce just saying it should be transparent all the way through. I don't see a big conflict here, and uh, I've learned – I'm sorry I was late. I will read your testimony, but I've already learned quite a bit just from what you've said, and I certainly agree with the idea of transparency and, uh, and accountability. That doesn't seem to be a big debate here, but uh, it seems to matter of where you're putting your emphasis, so thank you very much. I want to thank everybody. Uh, a uh, excellent uh, panel of, of witnesses, and um, I think some of you are now going to appear. You, you, this has been a warm up for your appearance before the Judiciary Committee, and I look forward to the subcommittee on administrative law uh, that is looking at the same issue. Uh, and we had earlier uh, tried to have a joint hearing, but we're not able to pull off the logistics of that. But uh, again, I appreciate your appearance and your uh, very thoughtful responses to all of our questions. And with that, our hearing is adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.